Welcome home. This is the Irish Roots Cafe where every day's a holiday and there's always room for one more. Come right this way. Have a seat with me today in the corner booth celebrating our 71st week. Sweeney clear the hall. Katie bar the door. Molly put on another pot of Irish coffee. It's time to get this show on the road. We've got another full house today, not a chair to spare. I'm Michael Laughlin, your host. Reach me on my webpage at irishroots.com where you can check out the written show notes on my blog and search all of our podcasts by search by uh, typing in any search term. And pretty soon you're going to be able to search every single one of the 60 books I've published in the last... Uh, 20 or 30 years uh, just by typing in a search term and uh, the entry is going to come up it's going to be pretty good uh, we've already got four books online like that I think it's uh, our Antrim book our Monaghan book our Surnames of Ireland book and uh, the Missouri Irish book we just added that this week you can go in there onto that wet, the page for that book and type in the term you're looking for or the name you're looking for or the event you're looking for and if it's in that book, it's going to come up and show you. Uh, uh, it's a little experiment we're doing, but I think you'll like it, especially when we get all 60 books done. But those books are ready right now. Well, let me see. What have we got going on today? Among today's topics are Irish DNA. What does R1B mean? What about Viking DNA in Ireland? Red hair and blue eyes? How about the new Y-DNA tree of mankind that's just been updated? Glennon family branches in Ireland. And remember, it's Y-DNA only when it comes to genealogy testing. And our members are searching for Crossan, Fox, Hanlon, Tyrrell, and Hart. And that reminds me to let you know that you can get all three of my free broadcast series online. That's the Irish in America Irish Song and Recitation, and this podcast right here, which is Irish Families Worldwide. Well, our notes this week, we're going to keep it short. We've got a really good interview, and I let it run long because it was so good. And uh, those of you that's been hearing about Irish DNA, I think this is going to be really, a uh, really special broadcast for you. You're going to end up uh, learning a little bit, and by the end of it, you'll be ready to uh, swab your cheek with a Q-trip tip, uh, mail it in, and become part of the growing crowd of folks that have discovered their Irish DNA. Uh, our special guest this week is Bennett Greenspan of FamilyTreeDNA.com. Bennett is a return guest, and he's prepared special information just for us Irish family researchers. We appreciate that. And, uh, you know, when I gave that talk down in Savannah, Georgia, just a few weeks back, uh, the folks raised their hand in the audience and noted that uh, Bennett was a good... Uh, a good resource for DNA and that uh, he was going to be a speaker and coming by uh, that region of the country uh, in just a few weeks following me. So yeah, it's always good to hear uh, somebody's name that you know when you're out there uh, talking in the country. Uh, now, before we get going, do we have anything else to talk about? Well, yeah, I think we will. It's time to raise our eyes skyward, give thanks, and ask for help. Before we ask for uh, DNA help... Here is today's member search list. New member Kevin Bonus of Calgary, Canada is looking for William Crossan, and that could have been Mick Crossan or Matt Crossan, uh, born 1857, County Derry, Ireland. And he left at the age of 24 to, to go to Durham, England. Number two, new member Maurice O'Connor of Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, the Fox family of Collasser, looking for Meredith Fox and Bridget Durkin Fox, married about 1857. Also, Conlon of Collasser and Swinford. Number three, new member Janice M. Easton of Newcastle, Australia. Hey, your Irish family's book is on the way, and Janice is researching Frances Hanlon, who was born around 1825 in New Ree County, Armagh. And it oh, sent to uh, 
Australia as a convict in 1840. That gives you some credentials there. Father Peter was a bootmaker and Mother Bridget Kelcher. Also, wife Ellen Vaughn of County Clare. Boy, that reminds me of old Father Vaughn back in County Clare back around 1980 who helped me uh, trace my ancestors back in Kelfanora. And let me see, uh, Janice goes on and says, uh, an Irish famine girl on Thomas Arbuthnot, 1850. That must be the ship, Thomas Arbuthnot, and uh, seeking Irish roots. Well, thank you, Janice. I hope it goes well for you. New member Eileen M. Flynn of Arlington, Virginia. Currently, I am looking for two branches. Uh, the Tyrrell family, who I believe are from Dublin, and Cassidy family from Charlestown County, Mayo. Both are from Ireland around the 1850s or 60s, and they moved to Batley, England. And number five, I think this will probably do it for the day. It's uh, new member Alta Hart of Farrow Oaks, California. And she's researching these families who were from County Armagh and County Down. That was Hart, Lochran, Murphy, McCreesh, and Mackin. Well, thanks to all our members because without you, these podcasts wouldn't be possible. So you've got many thousands of people out there that uh, owe you a debt of thanks for keeping this, this going and, and uh, running on. And uh, let me see. We've been working on that members area now for a couple of months. We've got most of the little bugs out, and we're getting ready to put some new things in there. Uh, one of them, of course, is going to be... Uh, Uh, documented coats of arms of Irish families, none of the Selly stuff. And uh, uh, we'll put the illustrations from the book of arms on there too, so you can check that out. And uh, we're going to just keep on adding things a little bit at a time. And I'm waiting for your feedback too to let you know what you might want or what you like. Uh, We might even do some genealogy videos, Irish genealogy videos to uh, give you a little little, uh, uh, help along the way. Um, but for now, I think it's time that we moved on to our interview for the day. Why don't you sit back, relax, and take a listen and learn all about your Irish DNA, no matter what part of the world you're in. Listen in to my interview with Bennett Greenspan. That repeat performance here, we talked with Bennett Greenspan, uh, can't remember how long ago it was about DNA and the Irish and got a little primer. And I know uh, several thousand new listeners here now haven't heard anything of it. So we thought we'd just have a little refresher course. And there's been so much going on in the world of DNA and so many uh, genealogists waking up to the fact. Uh, we thought we'd bring back uh, Family Tree DNA and Bennett Greenspan. Bennett, how are you? Uh, Mike, I'm great. And thanks for having me back. Well, sure. We sure look forward to it. I know so many people enjoyed that last talk that uh, uh, we had to bring you back. And I was just mentioning that uh, a couple of weeks back, I gave a little talk in Savannah, Georgia. And a lady stood up and said, well, now we're having uh, Bennett Greenspan speak to us uh, in the next week or two. Uh, Are you out out and about among the people this year? Uh, Well, I have a very, very busy summer schedule. I'm booked somewhere. Um, five times this summer, and so I'm going to be scooting all over the country, uh, evangelizing for genetic genealogy, uh, because I'm just trying to, you know, uh, enlarge that database for the benefit of everybody. Hey, that's right, and it sure is helping. There's, there's so much excitement out there. Everybody's starting to listen uh, a little bit closer now when you talk about DNA. Has there, has there there been any uh, uh, new developments over the last couple of months, or is everything just growing right apace? Well, the the biggest development that's taken place over the last couple of months is the introduction of a new Y-DNA tree of mankind that's on the male side. Every few years, the anthropologists republish the tree. They've effectively doubled the size of the tree, and it's produced more branches and sub-branches on that tree, and we're getting closer to where the genealogy at the tip of the tree is merging with what the anthropologists have been doing for the last several years. And what that gives us or will give us the opportunity to do is to actually see how 
or the migrational path of how our Irish ancestors ended up in Ireland and where they most likely came from on the continent of Europe before they ended up in Ireland thousands of years ago. And what do we think right now? Well, we, we think that the, that, that, that the majority of people in Ireland probably lived in southern France or northern Spain during the last ice age. And the present assumption is that they moved north when the ice age ended and got to you know, northern France and then sometime after that made their way across the, the channel and eventually arrived to Ireland. But there's another conflicting theory that says that the people may have left southern France, moved over into what today would be Germany, and then from there moved across the channel into, you know, England and Ireland. And so we really aren't sure of the migrational path, but I think in the next two or three years, Mike, that that, that, that is going to be cracked. And I think that we'll have a very, very uh, good idea of that migration path. Well, now you hear a lot of people talk when they start talking DNA and the Irish, they, they start saying things like R1B, uh, turn, <laughs> turning up in their genetic code. Now, what does that R1B mean when people start to mention it? Okay, very good question. There are 20 branches of the tree of mankind. Uh, branch A and branch B are found in among the oldest humans on the planet. Those, are, those guys are found today in South and Southeastern Africa. Uh, there's another branch called R, which is found in Europe, with R1A being found primarily in Eastern Europe and R1B being found primarily in Western Europe. In fact, the country that has the highest percentage of men from that R1B branch is Ireland. Most European countries have 60 or 70 percent of their folks who are R1B from that particular branch of the tree. Ireland happens to be about 90 percent R1B. And in fact, in northwestern Ireland, it's about 98 percent R1B, which means in effect that the Irish people are very homogeneous. In other words, the Irish people, by and large, come from the same genetic gene pool. And because Ireland was surrounded by water and was relatively inaccessible for thousands of years or not easily accessible, there weren't a lot of ship, you know, uh, ship-borne invaders who came to Ireland and who and, and who at least settled. They may have come and, and looked around and, and gazed upon the uh, upon the lovely ladies, but they didn't. It doesn't seem like they stayed. Now, would that be, would would you be talking about the Vikings? Then would they not have R one B? Actually, the Vikings are typically on a branch that's called I one, and so no, uh, typically you do not find R one B among the Vikings, and that's why it's pretty easy for us to. Uh, to separate out where those Vikings did go and where they did land. And by the way, we find them on the coastline of Scotland and we find them on the coastline of, um, of, of England. We find them on the, on the eastern side of Ireland, maybe on the southeastern side of Ireland. Right. But it doesn't seem, like they, doesn't seem like they went around to the north and the northwestern side of Ireland hardly at all. Boy, that's really interesting. That could make some uh, make some news in the history books at some point if we start to really define what happened in history and with the invaders and who stayed and who didn't. Uh, has, has there been any? Is there any other th- markers or any other certain things that uh, uh, an Irish researcher might be aware of when it's connected to DNA in the Irish? Well. I, um, what what I would say is that that the focus probably shouldn't be so much on the markers anymore, which we know very well. It should be uh, focused on the size of the database and how well Ireland is or isn't represented. And so, because I knew I was speaking to you today, I've gone through our database, Mike, and I have found that that. The, that the group with the that, that is the second most populous group in our database is Ireland. Good, got that. Who's and, number one? 
Well, England is number one, right? And and Scotland is number three, uh, but but uh, at this point, Ireland is solidly in uh, in second place. And if you look at the number of people in um, you know in Ireland and uh, and in the United States who are of Irish descent, and you look at the uh, number of people. Um, who are English and or of English descent, you can see on a percentage basis that Ireland is probably our, our, we probably have a higher percentage of people of Irish extraction in our database on a percentage basis than, than any other group. Sure, I know there's a lot of interest that we Irish got and somehow that the idea of the clan and family and uh, something about our past just sticks in there so we keep on hunting. I'm sure I'm glad that you're there to take care of us while we're looking. Uh, are there, uh, uh, you know, a person go in, say they come in and they get their test, they swab their cheek with that uh, uh, little Q-tip like thing and send it right back to you. That's all there is to it. Uh, when they get their results back first, are they confused or overwhelmed or what do they look for and how do they go about making sense out of what they've just done as far as the, uh, the DNA study? You know, Mike, have you been prepped for this? Because you're asking awful good questions today. No, these are uh, things I think <laughs> about. That's for sure. Well, that's good. Um, well, you know, DNA testing is really customized work. In other words, your results are not like your Irish neighbor uh, that that you may meet, and they're not like uh, they're not going to be identical to to another person whether he be you know english or, or irish or scottish they're all going to be a little bit different and so one individual might find that he's a match uh to to nile um whereas you might find another man who has very very few matches uh, we try to make it fairly simple in our database because we give you a list of all the people that you match and they get you get all their email addresses, so you can just email them and and ask questions. And we give them a place on our website that they can upload their genealogy, so you could peer through their genealogy and try to see where you and they might have a common connection. Uh, but but some people are confused, and that's because most of us don't have uh, real real strong science backgrounds, and we understand that we're explaining science essentially to non-science majors, which is why we have six people at Family Tree DNA who do nothing but answer your emails and answer your phone calls all day long. Now, it's interesting. We log about 1,600 email questions from existing customers who are asking initial questions or follow-up questions about their results every single week. Good and gosh. And of course, you know we have uh, five phone lines, and those are most of the time going uh, pretty frequently as well. So we understand that a number of people are not going to intuitively understand their results. Now, certainly, if you look in your database of recent ethnic origins and you see it says Ireland, 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 Scotland, Ireland, England, Scotland, Ireland, Ireland, then you know. That, that by and large, all of your male ancestors on that line came from Ireland. And sometimes those Irish folks might have provided us some very specific information as to the county that they may happen to be from. But if you happen to be that 10 percent of, uh, of Ireland that doesn't descend from R1B, that might in fact have a uh, a, a new stay, a new Stone Age Neolithic farming background, or a Viking background, and you see matches to Ireland, and then a lot of Norway and Sweden and Denmark uh, or Iceland. You you may be a little confused, and we understand that. That's why we always encourage people to contact us uh, to talk about their results. There's no charge for. For phone support or for email support, we love when people contact us because we want people to get the most out of DNA testing that they possibly can. Gosh, with all the phone calls I get, could I borrow four or five of those people and have them ask, answer questions to all my folks that, that are listening in today? That's well, such... only, 
<laughs> Only on the weekends. <laughs> That's really that's really extremely good customer service. That's sort of the direction I think we all got to move into uh, uh, just to stay out there and, and uh, alive and serving people today. That's that's just uh, that's really excellent. So people can actually they they can say I've had people talk to me before and say, boy, I sent away my DNA and we've been from England as, as long as I've ever known it. And here I get a you know, I'm getting a marker that might say or a, a sequence that says Ireland. Uh, and they're really surprised. They're, I mean, they're happy to know it, but uh, every once in a while there is a surprise there when you get that DNA back and you realize that uh, the, your family tree might be a little broader than you thought. That, that's absolutely right, and we find that uh, quite often because generally someone's knowledge of their ancestry only goes back three or four or five generations. Uh, obviously, if your ancestors move from... Uh, from the continent over to, um, you know, over to Ireland, or they moved from, you know, Scandinavia on a Viking ship a thousand years ago. Most people aren't going to have those, those memories, but DNA doesn't forget and DNA doesn't lie. Uh, sometimes it takes us a little while to assimilate all that data and get comfortable, you know, with that, with that new knowledge. But um, I had a real interesting situation happen yesterday. I was talking to a fella, and he said, you know, he said, my brother did a DNA test, and I did a DNA test, and we didn't know that the other brother had done a DNA test. We were just both interested in it and had heard about it. Fortunately, we both tested with you, and we matched 37 for 37, Bennett, and that was really good news for all of us. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) And so, but but I will but I will tell you and your readers that that we really don't want to be in effect a paternity testing service. And so, if you're thinking of doing a DNA test, since now so many people have, maybe it would be a good idea to call your brother and to make sure that he hadn't done a DNA test because you know I'm really not looking for, you know, for people you know to test just for the sake of testing. I mean, I'm happy to have one brother test. And if you really wonder if he's if he's truly um, a brother rather than the, uh, you know, than, than, than a, a potential redheaded stepchild, then, then certainly, you know, you can both test, but I don't want to see people, you know, testing and wasting their money. Of course, these two brothers matched each other identically as we would expect. And it's always nice for them to say, boy, we're both glad that we tested with family tree DNA, but, uh, but, you know, it was kind of a shame that they both tested and didn't talk to each other because they could have, you know, they could have kept a, you know, uh, uh, you know, a couple hundred dollars in their pocket. Hey, that's right. You know, you mentioned something there about a redhead. Have they traced back certain genes to redheads or to certain areas of the country? Or I thought I heard a story, a theory about that a couple months back. Well, actually, uh, what you probably heard was about the blue eyes. There was a, uh, a study that said that a mutation, which, uh, which, is, which is associated with blue eyes, took place about 12,000 years ago. And what that means is that every person with blue eyes on the planet at some genetic level is related to each other. The same thing is probably true for red hair, since red hair is also a recessive trait. And the reason that you have red hair very, very prominent in the Irish population is because essentially, if you want to see a large group of people who all essentially look alike or or look similar to each other, is you'll put some unrelated people on an island leave them the heck alone and come back in a few thousand years and they will have been, you know, kissing cousins by that time. You'll have had a lot of relatives marrying relatives and you have an accumulation of those genes, genes which express for blue eyes, red hair, lighter complexion, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, What that means is that because Ireland has been shielded from most invaders for a long, long time by the benefit of having water, by the benefit that it's an island, uh, what that means is that the Irish people are 
probably a little bit more closely related to each other on a genetic level than, let's say, people that you might find in Europe proper. Oh, yeah, that's understandable. And I thought I thought one other thing. Say you've got a Donovan out there that gets his test back from you. He just sent it in and it comes back. And I was thinking, now, what else is he going to learn? I thought, well, he might learn that he's related to uh, some of the Donovans up in uh, Washington or some of the Donovans down in Texas. Uh, uh, it's also a way to tie the clan together here in uh, the U.S. too, isn't it? Well, that that's exactly right. Uh, generally... Uh, there, there's, it, this is generally a two-step process. Generally, if people test here in the United States, the first thing they're trying to do is they're trying to see which of the Donovans in the United States or the United States and Canada am I related to? And that's the initial question that people are trying to seek. But as soon as that initial question has been answered, the next question is, how am I or who am I related to of the Donovans over in Ireland? And so right. people are trying to jump across the puddle to get back to see if their ancestors came from, you know, from Ross Common or from another county. Uh, and that, that's where it gets very, very exciting because, you know, the, when, when the records have been lost for whatever reason over history, it makes it very, very hard to connect with your actual family back in Ireland or wherever it happens to be. Uh, but what genetic genealogy allows someone to do is to test here, to test uh, some people back over in Ireland, and then you can actually find which of the Donovans you're related to. I have one very um, – uh, well, I, ha I had a customer very early on in our, in our business's career – who was a Glennon, and he started testing Glennons here in the United States and actually proved that most of those Glennons were related, and then he took a trip over to Ireland, and he found that he was related. Uh, he started testing Glennons over there, and he found that he was related to one set of Glennons, but about 50 miles away, there was another family or clan of Glennons, and he wasn't related to them. And so it was very interesting because he was able to show that, that his Glennons came from here, and they're related to all these Glennons in the United States. But that other group of Glennons from, from 80 or 90 kilometers away from his Glennons were related to another set of Glennons here in the United States. And so that was really wonderful for both extended families of Glennons because they were then able to determine where their deepest ancestral Irish roots came from. Now, do you know if, uh, I haven't checked on this in a long time, how many uh, of the, the folks actually that live in Ireland, Irish citizens, so to speak, uh, how many of them have taken tests? And, and of course, the more tests that they take, uh, uh, DNA samples, uh, the sooner we're going to be able to realize just how closely we're related to each family. And I wonder if you've heard, uh, have they been testing themselves over there? Well, that's that's the that's the bad news. I would say, Mike. I would say approximately ninety percent of the uh, of the people from Ireland who or who list themselves as from Ireland who have tested are living today in either Australia or the United States or Canada, and probably only ten percent of those who have tested actually live in Ireland today. And probably of those 10% uh, who are from Ireland who have tested, probably about half of those have been underwritten by hopeful American cousins and right. the rest have taken, and the rest have, have heard about us one way or another and have taken a test with us directly. So the number of people in Ireland who have actually tested is relatively small compared to the number of people abroad who have tested. But there seems to be a growing movement on the part of Irish families here to reach back over to Ireland to get potential cousins tested to flush out that database. And I really think that's the next step that we're going to see over the next couple of years. Yeah, it looks like we're just going to have to be evangelists and get, uh, get our uh, Irish uh, ancestors 
uh, or this, that part of the tree to test from Ireland itself. And I think we'll be able to do it. We might have to have a, a Guinness at the pub to talk to him a few times, but after we uh, explain it all, I think that'll happen. Now, uh, one last question. I, we've got a couple thousand listeners uh, down in Australia. Is there anything unique about Australian DNA or Australian Irish connections? Uh, well, there's nothing unique about Australian Irish DNA. It's the same DNA that we find in Ireland and that we find, you know, so often in the United States. So even though uh, even though uh, those Irish folks have gone, you know, halfway around the globe, you know, twelve or thirteen thousand miles away, uh, we can still uh, we can still match you up easily with uh, with your Irish cousins. Uh, here, here stateside or in Canada or back in Ireland, uh, and it's made all the easier now that the database has grown. In fact, our Y-DNA database, Mike, uh, is now over 126,000 samples. I think when you and I talked before, it had just it was just in the low, like maybe 105, 106,000 samples. So right. we've added so we've added about 20,000 samples since uh, we've talked, and we're getting to the point now where where we don't think there are, there are many Irish DNA signatures that we haven't seen. We think we've got nearly all of them, which means that as far as Ireland goes, the database is reaching or has reached critical mass. And, uh, of course, as sure as I say that, you know, someone's going to test and not have any matches. But that's the exception now. That's the that, that's the rare exception now rather than the rule. At this point, you know, we're seeing uh, matches for nearly everyone from Ireland, which means from a statistical standpoint, uh, we've reached that critical mass point. That means that, that if you haven't done the DNA testing, the hard work's been done. The pioneers have already tested. They've already put themselves into the database. And that makes it much, much more likely that any future test taker is actually going to have matches right off the bat. Well, now, and I guess we should say, just to remind folks that haven't heard anything about DNA, uh, uh, if for genealogy purposes, you really have to get a man in the family uh, to take the test. It's, it's, that's known as the Y-DNA. That's exactly right. And uh, I know there are tests for the female line, too. Uh, is that of any interest to the genealogists? Well, I think the way we should look at it is that the Y chromosome is great for genealogy, and it can also tell you about your deeper ancestral migration patterns. That's what we call anthropology. Female DNA, because it changes so slowly, is really a great tool for anthropology, but it's not very effective genealogically speaking. Of course, genealogy on the female side is also made more difficult by the fact that the ladies generally change their name in every generation. And so between the fact that the, that the female inherited mitochondria changes so slowly and that the ladies give up their, their names when they uh, get married, it's really an anthropology product. So it, unfortunately, it, it is not quite as effective as the Y DNA testing for a man from a genealogical standpoint. But you know, these are the rules of mother nature. They're not rules that I made up. Well, as most men find out, uh, uh, the females make fewer mistakes than the males and that makes them harder to trace. So we'll just have to accept <laughs> that as fact. Uh, I was in, uh, it was just last week. I was at the uh, national genealogical society conference here in Kansas city. It's a national, uh, genealogy group and i finally got to at least uh st stop by and see lee uh she answers the phone there a lot when i call i know and they i tell you they were sitting down talking uh, dna with people uh just the whole time it's good to see that you were there and that uh they were kept so busy uh, uh it's it's no it's no wonder you've uh, got six people answering answering questions there but uh do you send people out to uh, uh many genealogical conventions or is it just a few specific uh, shows we, we probably uh display and attend eight or ten genealogical conferences um in north america a year uh, generally i go to those uh, or one of us um uh one of us founders go this show we just happen to to send uh 
uh, two of the people from our office, and it was kind of funny because I asked one of the people from the office which was the tougher job, going to a show and, and seeing customers and selling kits or actually sitting behind her uh, desk and answering phone calls and running emails. And she looked at me and she said, I can't believe how hard you guys work at these shows. People are just coming up to the booth every moment, talking to us and ordering kits. And, 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 and I turned around and the day was over already, but my, but I was on my feet the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I saw it. It's, it's a, it's a natural fact. They're telling those stories because, uh, they were just swamped the whole time. Even if the, the hall was, uh, sort of slow and they were on break everybody was in in seminars and whatnot there'd still be somebody there uh talking to them all the time so they sure did a good job and uh it was sure good to see uh, some folks uh that i had dealt with before at that uh little convention well i think we'll sign off now i appreciate your time coming back for this second time here to the cafe and uh is there any other thing you wanted to mention before we uh do say goodbye well, I just want to mention that if uh, you haven't taken a DNA test yet, please do so. And once you get your results, do not be shy. Send us an email. Ask your questions. Um, uh, go to our library. Look at some of the books that are in there to learn more about this because genetic genealogy is starting to become mainstream for us genealogists. It's just another tool in the toolkit of the prepared genealogist. It's not, uh, uh, it's, it's not the exception anymore. It's becoming the rule. And, uh, and I can only thank the general public for being so uh, willing to experiment with a new tool. And that's, that's made it a fact. Well, what's now we've got a link on our webpage for uh, members to go and join up uh, uh, to family tree DNA. Uh, is there an email uh, direct uh, that you can give right now that they might want to hook into? Absolutely. Any question should be directed to info, I-N-F-O, at FamilyTreeDNA.com. Ooh, great. And uh, once they send that in, how long does it take to get results? Uh, uh, once they send an email in, they should get a response within 24 hours, generally within just a few hours. Uh, weekends are obviously a little bit longer. Uh, the secret is that I do come in and answer emails over the weekend because if I didn't, I wouldn't be able to do anything other than answer emails uh, and, and phone calls on Monday. And I really do like to be able to do several things on Mondays. Um, and once they send in their DNA uh, results to us and they get an email in the mail that says the kit's been returned, it should be three or four weeks and they should have those results. Oh, good. So, th so, so a month or so and everything's done and they, they've, uh, made some kind of new connection and it not only might pay off today, but somebody might take the test a month after you take yours and uh, it can open up a whole new branch of your family tree. Mike, I want you to know that in my own family that I tested on my mother's 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 line and I tested seven years ago and I never had a match on my mother's side. So I was the, 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 your typical cobbler who was walking around with holes in his shoes i've been making matches for people for years but on my mom's side i didn't have one match last week i got my first match on my mother's dna and i called my match last night and just uh i, I got him he was just coming off of a an airplane but he and i clearly show uh uh, show a connection on our mother's mother's line. He wasn't able to talk to me. We're going to talk over the holiday weekend, but we're trying to figure out how we're related. And, uh, and so uh, getting that match uh, just brought a smile to my face. And so in that respect, now I understand why my customers get so excited when they have matches. Boy, it's good to hear that even the experts are finding out new things through DNA today. So that keeps it fun for all of us and uh, tells us just how real it is. Well, Bennett, it's been great. I hope I can uh, uh, get you again after a little bit of time's passed and we can catch up on uh, what's been happening in the world of DNA. Thank you, Mike. Well, thanks to all of our members. Like I said before, without you, these podcasts would not be possible. Remember to send your comments and questions to me at uh, www.irishroots.com. You can click on our uh, comments or our contact link on the webpage. 
and leave your message or report on things in your part of the world when you call my phone number at 816-256-3360. Members foot the bill so they get first priority, but we're open to all. And by the way, a big thank you to all of our members and away. Thank you.